Hi everyone. I'm uh, just about to give this presentation. I got a little bit delayed because I guess Instagram decided to change how they do their go lives. Um, and I was trying to figure out how to do it because I haven't done it since they made this last update. So apologies for that, but uh, we're about to get started here. A lot to share with you today um, related to this Vitruvian Man uh, recent work um, and very excited to share it with you. So I'm gonna go ahead and get it set up here. So just bear with me. All right, so let me go ahead and turn on my, there we go, okay. So I'll try to get the glare of this out. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So you guys probably remember from the Vitruvian man work we did last year that, you know, what da Vinci did was not actually, when he made the Vitruvian man, the most iconic I guess, of all of the things that he has done. Um, when he made the Vitruvian Man, he basically did not do it as a perfect squaring of the circle because a perfect squaring of the circle would have meant that, um, that it would have either been the red line here for the square against this circle here, or it would have been the blue line of this square. But what da Vinci did was actually this white square. So the proportions are completely different. So you know, wanting to find out why uh, has been a real uh, odyssey to try to understand fully. And we found lots of things already that were related to the fact that if you notice that uh, if you place the square over the center of the circle, it marks exactly the base of where a pentagon would land. Okay, so that was obviously something very powerful and important because what you also notice is if you place that square centered over the circle, it also fits perfectly inside of a hexagon that would be exascribed around that, around uh, the, the structure of the square and, and, and be tangent to the circle. So, but there's more to this story, so let's keep going now, right? So you probably also remember that one of the things that we had done was found that there was, um, you know, the spiral of Theodorus basically would fit exactly over, and we found this really just because of the class. I don't know if you guys remember, but what we were doing is I drew this one picture, and, uh, and as I was drawing the spiral of Theodorus, on the prior page was, uh, was the, the, the squaring of the circle, and I noticed this kind of bleed through in the page, and I thought, wow, that kind of matches up really perfectly, and when you line it up to have one inch be the starting point for the spiral, you can see the spiral going around behind it, and it seemed to have very significant correspondences, the most important of which was it landed exactly on the corner of the square, right, of the da Vinci square. So that was interesting for me as well, and um, so I'm trying to just get out of this. i go back to this. There we go go back into presentation mode. There we go. So I wanted to, uh, to, to further investigate this, but one of the things that came out of it as well was that the Vitruvian man's head was right in between the square root of 24 and the square root of 26. And I thought that was interesting, and I remember talking about it last year as well, because each of these points, as you might recall, were all landing at, at very kind of cardinal points on the circle. And what the spiral of Theodorus actually is, is simply to take side one and another side one value, and then you draw a right triangle next to that and follow a spiral around. Each side will always have one, and then you'll always end up with the perfect combination of all numbers. It, it ends up going, you know, one, square root of two, square root of three, square root of four, square root of five, square root of six, square root of seven. It just follows all numbers out to infinity. And this is a, a very important spiral uh, that was, you know, around in ancient times in ancient Greece, and it's known as the spiral of Theodorus. So it was definitely known at the time of Leonardo da Vinci. So what we noticed is that there were correspondences related to that spiral also, that the finger landed exactly on the, the square root of 31 right here. Uh, you'll also notice that not only does it perfectly flank the head, but uh, within it, you could even draw a, a line across where this 
line is that goes underneath, right, right on the throat chakra, you can see this line right here that Da Vinci drew. Da Vinci drew several lines, including these vertical lines and these horizontal lines. And we found that this marks the, the places inside the Great Pyramid where there are likely new chambers that have yet been undiscovered. So the heart chakra would be the king's chamber, and the, the throat chakra would be the next chamber. And there is, in fact, a void space inside the Great Pyramid that is right above the Grand Gallery and, and points right to the upper right side. You know, the king's chamber is off-center to the upper right side of the uh, of the the Great Pyramid, uh, and from the from the uh, from the King's Chamber. So basically, you'll you'll see here then that that each of these square root of twenty four, square root of twenty five, square root of twenty six now are all sort of showing up around this head point. And what was also interesting is that these numbers were very significant to Rosicrucian encryptions left by Shakespeare and uh, and and Sir Francis Bacon, as well as uh, several others that are involved in the. Uh, John D. time frame of Queen Elizabeth I, where many of these Rosicrucian symbologies were encrypted. In fact, uh, if you go on to Alan Green's page, you'll find uh, thebard.com. Uh, you'll, you'll find also on his Instagram page lots of information about the numbers 624 and 426. They are the central thesis of the entire sort of Shakespeare story, uh, which also includes Edward de Vere going missing uh, and, and, and never coming back. And both were related to, you know, 624 and 426 dates, so June 24th and April 26th. So we knew this already, so this wasn't a great mystery to us when we had found this. But what was very interesting about it as we dive deeper into this notion of this 24 and 26 is we found a connection to Royal Arch Freemasonry, which I'm going to show you what we found today. Another thing we talked about then was that uh, the line that da Vinci drew was slightly off, ever so slightly off. Uh, he's got a part line right here in the center, and the part line is just very, very slightly off the exact center. So it means to say that the Vitruvian man head is slightly tilted, right? It's slightly tilted. And, and it's sort of, from our perspective, if we were the Vitruvian man ourselves, it would be the head is tilted somewhat to the left, to its left side. So what's the significance of this 24 and 26 and 25 thing then? Well, what I just noticed is that if I drew a triangle inside the circle and the square to draw a right triangle, and you know, many of you know, I've been doing a lot of work as relates to right triangles uh, because that is the foundation of factorization and that's been a major part of the work I've been working on over the last you know couple of years. But if you were to take the one sort of geometric structure that you could combine both the proportions, right? It really would be to to draw a line down the center, right? Because that's combining the length of the square and the circle, right? And then also to have it intersect right here at the base of the square. Now Da Vinci very purposefully drew a square that was neither a squaring of the circle because it was neither the area squaring nor was it the uh, the perimeter squaring which would mean to say that both the values would match as I said in the beginning. Either the perimeter is matching the circumference of the circle or the area is matching the area of the square. And in this case what da Vinci drew in his proportions are very unique because they were kind of in between both of those proportions. But what you'll notice is that if I draw a line from the top of the circle down to the base of the square, an interesting proportion pops out of this. And it happens to be exactly 26 for a hypotenuse, 24, and 10. So here we have, again, 26, 24, and 10. And it's sort of giving us some sort of reciprocal relationship of the 26 and 24 here. So that's really, that was kind of a, a mind blower for me just to see that. So I started drawing all this out. And, you know, I did it all on this page where I started noticing, okay, if I draw this line down to here, this is creating a very interesting shape um, that has a very specific degree angle, which is 22, you know, 0.32 uh, degrees. And 
And so I, I was then looking at that to see what's the logarithmic relationship of that and what are the other you know, numbers that kind of come off of that. And what I, what I noticed is that you know, this is something that seems to be very, very fundamental to the combination of this particular ratio of circle to this particular ratio of square. So now we know, though, that the, that the Vitruvian man has a measurement of a radius of 4.32 inches, as you can see here. So it's got 4.32 inches as its radius, and therefore its diameter is 8.64 inches. Well, with an 8.64 inch diameter, then what that is saying is that this side of this right triangle is going to be 8.64 inches, as you would expect. And then this line here is going to be the hypotenuse, which will be 9.36 inches. And it'll have a base across the base of 7.2 inches. Now, you might remember, last year I'd said, okay, the top of this square is the square root, you know, 1 over the square root of 2, which is times 10, which is 7.07 .07 inches. But the base is wider than the top. So you can see here that the line that da Vinci drew is just a little bit narrower, right, inward, than it is down here at the base, where this square is absolutely matching it. This is exactly a 7.2 inch base. A 7.2 is really important as relates to the fathom because 72 inches is the fathom. It's six feet, right? And a man's outstretched arms are supposed to be what he can fathom or what she can fathom. So what's happening here is this ratio of 7.2, 8.64 is exactly a 1.2x. So 1.2 times 7.2, now we're looking at this full isosceles triangle, is going to give me 8.64. And then 8.64 multiplied by 1 and 1 twelfth equals 9.36. Now, Nikola Tesla talked about all the mysteries of the universe being embedded in the numbers 3, 6, and 9. So here we have the hypotenuse of the da Vinci uh, Vitruvian man is coming in exactly at 9.36 inches. Now, of course, the ratio here is still 26, 24, and 10 and then it would be 20 for, you know, a full isosceles triangle. So now you may know that I've been doing a lot of work related to factorization. And what I had found in 2019 was that the Pythagorean right triangle is the fundamental triangle uh, and is the basis of all factorization. Right? It's the basis of all factorization. And, and that is, I'm trying to move this around so you can see this a little bit better. There we go. The basis of all factorization because you could take X and Y, right? So these two is factor one and factor two. And the relationship of the sum and the product of two integers is always expressed in right triangles without exception. So what do I mean by that? So let's take five times seven equals 35 and 5 plus 7 equals 12. That means there must be a geometric relationship between uh, the number 12 and 35. Well, I discovered it, and here it is. That geometric relationship is simply the height versus the hypotenuse. But you have to transform these very slightly, right? It could be the height versus hypotenuse, or it could be, in this case, when you've got the numbers farther apart, it becomes the base versus the hypotenuse. So in this case, when the numbers are farther apart, we know now that you can simply take the number 35, take its square root value, and then take the number 12, right? And you're going to take that and divide it by 2. So the square root of a product is entangled to the halving of the sum of x and y. So I'll say that again. The square root of x and y, so x times y, is entangled with the sum divided by 2 of x and y. So x and y, x plus y divided by 2 is entangled to the product of x times y square rooted. And so when I understood that relationship, I then was able to factorize very large numbers. In fact, uh, uh, very, very large numbers now, which I haven't really announced fully yet, but, uh, but you'll be hearing about soon enough. So now, what happens if we apply an infinite sum and an infinite product to a right triangle? 
Now, if you guys are deep into math, you might have heard of infinite series, you know, convergent series and divergent series of numbers. And you'll find this information right on, uh, you know, number file, which is one of those channels I love to watch on YouTube. And, uh, and so what they present on there is you'll find the infinite sum looks something like this. And don't be intimidated by this. This is just the sum symbol and infinity and n and n equals 1. And so all that really is is this series right here. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7 plus 8 plus plus. When you add all the numbers up infinitely, somehow, somehow, algebraically, the answer comes out to negative 1 12th. And if you'd like to watch a video on that, I highly recommend. There's many. Uh, there was a German mathematician who tried to debunk it, in fact, who then later on lived to regret it and had to debunk his own debunking uh, in kind of an embarrassing but funny video. But uh, there have been many mathematicians who've actually proven this, including Ramanujan as well. Infinite product would be 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5 times 6 times 7 to infinity. And now you're ending up with a value that is the square root of 2 pi. So you might say, well, how can you have infinite series multiplication? Doesn't it just equal infinity? And infinite series addition, doesn't that also just equal infinity? But now we're saying that they actually converge to these values. Negative 1 12th, how could it be negative? Right? Well, there's a whole much longer video on that, and that's not the purpose of my video, but just take it today that this is well accepted and highly regarded amongst the mathematical community as being correct, just as this is as well, the square root of 2 pi. So I thought, you know what, since I know that there is an entanglement between the sum and the product of the same two numbers, let me go ahead and test this out and see what happens if I apply it using the same line of thinking to a right triangle. And here's what I got. So these are the equations. So infinite sum divided by 2. This is infinite product right here. It's also called infinite factorial, right? Square rooted. And we know that that's 2 pi. And another way to express 2 pi is just tau. Right, one tau. And then you would just, just, just take, you know, the, the fourth root of tau is what this would be equivalent to. So the fourth root of tau, and this comes out to be 1 over 0.24. So then you've got over here, so you start off with 1 one twelfth, and I took away the, the negative and the positive uh, because in this plane, you could say that's kind of an imaginary plane, taking away the positive polarity. I'm just looking for the pure ratio, whether it's positive or negative on, you know, Cartesian planes or, you know, three imaginary planes and in quaternions and one uh, real number plane. It doesn't matter because I'm just looking to see what correspondences I find if I just take 1 12th, divide it by 2, and apply it to, you know, a right triangle that has its other side that is going to be the square root of... 2 pi, or the square, the fourth root, rather, of, uh, of tau. So what do I get for the third side, then, in doing that? Well, then you can just use c squared minus a squared equals b squared, and let's call this a and let's call this b. And this then becomes that equation. So that's just, you know, this, this same equation re-expressed, right, in a, in, a different, in a different format. And by the way, there should be a over 2 on that, too, I just noticed. So the answer, though, comes out to be 1 over 0.259. Now, that was really interesting to me because I was like, well, that's kind of bizarre. I didn't really notice also at that time when I first saw this, this relationship between 24 and 26. I mean, clearly this is really close. So I was like, wait, is this possibly related to 24 and 26 again? And Therefore, this third side, which turns out to be, you know, the, the side that is the infinite product, comes out to be 1 over 0 0.063, uh, oh, sorry, 0 0.631624, which ends up being 
1.5832, and and this becomes 4.16666, repeating, and this becomes, which you'll see these numbers in a second, and this side becomes um, basically 3.85415. So now we've got this 24 and 26 kind of showing up here again. We've got a number down here which is really close to the square root of 10, which is also very interesting. So let me zoom in on this again. So something weird happens now because we start noticing that basically you got 1 over 24 and 1 over 26 here, because it was really that close, close value, 259, which I'll come back to that 259 in just a moment. But when we flip these numbers and actually make this be the hypotenuse of 26, and now we just take these cross reciprocal values, something bizarre kind of happens that the, the same triangle still exists with the same proportions and everything, which is kind of weird. So we've got this reciprocity going back and forth here. And then secondly, that you've got um, this value here also does relate to 25 because it's 1 over 2.5 squared times 10. So there's that same sort of 25. So you've got 24, 25, and 26. Now, if we do it the reciprocal way, which is 26, 24, we end up with 10 and 2 as the total length across an isosceles triangle. That would be the combination of the two right triangles. So what does this mean now? When I took that exact triangle, remember, all I did is I started with an infinite sum and an infinite product, and then I'm ending up with an infinite delta, and it's giving me the same proportions as exist in the combination of the square and circle that da Vinci left to almost an identical match. The proportions are coming out to be the same. How could that even be? Right? I mean, that was kind of like a mind blower for me. How is it even possible that the infinite sum and the infinite product, and when you think about the infinite product is really related to the circumference, right? Because the circumference of the circle is going to be, you know, this, this tau, um, you know, this tau number, which is 6.283. It's 3.14 times 2, right? It's basically pi times 2 is tau. And it's already infinite because it never ends, right? It's, a, it's an irrational value, so it never truly stops. You know, it's been said that the circle uh, circumference and the, and the center of the circle have a relationship as follows, that the, the center of the circle is everywhere, and yet in the universal circle, right? And yet the circumference is nowhere. So the center point can be everywhere. <laughs> And the circumference can be nowhere. Well, it kind of speaks to this notion of having, you know, this relationship that is considered kind of uh, infinite, right? Absolutely infinite. So now we're going to look at the ratios of infinity versus infinity. Because even in an infinite world or infinite context, we have to understand that there's still going to be ratio relationships between everything. So this is what I mean by everything being dimensionless right? Everything being dimensionless. So what I also noticed was another correspondence to 624, and this actually blew my colleague Alan Green away because he's been spending his whole, you know, last 17 years working on this. And what I found was that the right triangle with 1 over 24 or 0.24, and the decimal doesn't really matter so much, but the right triangle with 1 over 0.24 uh, as its hypotenuse, has a height of 1 over 0.26 and a base of 1 over 0.624. Now that 624 is really close to the square root of 25, right? Because 624, 6, 625 is the square of 25. So you've got, I said square root of 25, I meant square root of 624 equals 25. So it comes out to 24.97999, right? What? That's kind of incredible, right? So here you've got 24 and 26 and 624. Um, I was really blown away by this realization, just completely blown away by it. 
And so again, you see this reciprocity showing up. 24 versus 1 over 24, 1 over 26 versus 26, and then 10 versus 1 over 0.624. So there's a mirror reciprocal inverse symmetry that seems to connect the numbers 1, 25, and 624. Okay, now let's take it to physics and see what we can do by finding out what are the factors then. Because so far, we've just found the infinite sum, we found the infinite product, but what are the actual factors? And in order to find the factors, all I need to do is I need to take the 1.583233 and I'm going to add it to 4.166666. And then that number is going to be 5.7499, which is 2.4 squared, interestingly, just a tiny bit shy of it. And then 4.1666 minus 1.583233 is going to give me 2.58343. Now, most people would never have recognized what that number was, but I immediately recognized it as, wait a minute, that's the exact square root of gravity. How could that be the square root of gravity? So I've just started with these mathematical concepts of the infinite sum and the infinite product. And then now the relationship of gravity is coming out of that. So I now have two factors. The factors are 2.4 squared, which is 5.75, and 2.4. 58343, which is the square root of gravity. That squares to 6.6740, which is the gravitational constant. So that's, again, kind of blowing me away. Well, then I saw this video that Nassim Haramein had sent to me, and it was, uh, it was really interesting because what it was showing is the relationship between e equals mc squared and rest mass and total mass, and all of it being embedded in a right triangle. And so you've got PC here, which is another way of, of sort of talking about momentum, right? And this arc goes around just like they've been doing on my spirals, if you've noticed how I make the spirals out of these right triangles. So you've got m naught c squared, which is c squared being the speed of light squared. m naught is rest mass, and rest mass and energy are... You know, rest energy are the same thing. So rest mass energy are kind of synonymous terms. And then you have uh, total mass over here. So what happens is you add momentum. Imagine I have a baseball, and I'm that ma the baseball has a certain amount of mass. If I throw that baseball really fast and I add a lot of velocity and momentum to that ball, then the, the effect is that it's going to have an increase on its total mass because I have to add the kinetic energy, which is really this section right here. So you can see if I took this arc from the base of this height of this right triangle and just continued it around, it would go to right here. Well, all the rest of this becomes kinetic mass, and then those two have to be combined to find the total mass. Well, the inverse of total mass and rest mass is time. And this is pretty well known. Um, in the physics community. If you just go on the physics community, it's very well uh, understood and believed that the inverse of energy is time. So now I started to figure out, okay, we're looking at something very different here now. Because remember, the starting point was, let me just first draw a line and see what the proportion of this right triangle would be within the Da Vinci Vitruvian Man. And what does it come out to be? It comes out to be a 26-24 relationship uh, that's going to give me a particular uh, type of spiral so that I could continue a spiral all the way around this if I wanted to, which has a log base of 1.08. And in addition, I then said, unrelated to it, what if I took infinite sum and infinite product and applied it to a right triangle the same way I've been doing to solve factorization. And then what would the two factors be? And the two factors of the infinite sum and the infinite product right, that create those numbers are 2.4 squared and gravity, the square root of gravity. That just seemed really bizarre. So now I've got this particular triangle 
and I'm finding the relationship into physics, right? applying the mathematics. So I took the rest mass energy equations and the total mass energy, and they're inherent to the right triangle already. And then looking at their inverse values, so this is their, their normal value, their inverse values would be you know, the 1 over uh, 0.24, 1 over 0.259, and that 259 is a number that very much relates to precession of equinox, right? So most people believe that the precession of equinox is 25,920 years. And the Earth's wobble, if you look it up on NASA's website, um, is, you know, approximately 26,000 years. In fact, we are at a distance from the galactic center of about 26,000 light years. It's another kind of coincidence. So this number keeps showing up over and over and over again. Most of the time, people round it to 26. But 25,920 is an important part of the cycle of, uh, you know, the cycle that we call precession. So the precession uh, of the equinoxes refers to the observable phenomenon of the rotation of the heavens, a cycle which spans a period of approximately 25,920 years. Now, if you look at the Indian uh, Yuga cycles, the Vedic mathematicians, and they all said that it was actually 24,000 years because on one half of the cycle, it's longer, and because of a mass dilation on the other half of the cycle, it becomes shorter. So we have two cycles that gets mashed together and average at 24,000 as their mean time. So on the far end of the cycle, when we're far away from a binary star, which is called Sirius A, we have a 25,920 year cycle. That means we have 2,160 year aeons on average, each of those periods. But as we get to the other side of the cycle, gradually we start to sort of that whole process shortens. And so you have a 21,600 year cycle, which means that each of the aeons are significantly shorter, right? By about the same exact percentage. And then the average then becomes a 2000 year aeon cycle over 24,000 years, because 21,600 plus 25,920 divided by two equals just shy of 24,000 years. But then that means that maybe this line here is representing the total rest mass energy and its inverse relationship is 25,920. And then this hypotenuse is giving us a value that is related directly to the average, which comes out to 24,000 years and relates to time dilation. And this change is a change in gravitational pull. And as you probably saw in the film Interstellar, you'll notice that time actually uh, only passed for about one hour when they were on this planet that was close to a black hole. And yet they were gone for 23 years. So time changes with gravity and mass changes. This is called mass time or gravity and mass time dilation. So does the sun have a binary partner? And if so, is it potentially Sirius A, as it's widely believed? There are a number of institutes, even the Binary Research Institute, you'll find a lot about. And one of my fellow uh, friends and researchers, Walter Cretton, who's also an entrepreneur, a successful fellow here in Newport Beach, uh, helped to establish that and, and wrote a book called The Lost Star. And it's a fascinating read. If you have not read it yet, I highly recommend it. And people like um, uh, Sage Silent, who's a friend of mine, on, on social media, and we've met in person in Egypt. Um, you know, he's definitely someone who tracks very closely as well all of these types of things related to the, uh, the cycle or the great year. It was first referenced in our history by Plato. Plato referred to it as this long cycle of the Earth, and it takes exactly that long for the wobble of the Earth to complete. So all I did was I took the infinite sum, which is a purely mathematical context, the infinite product, and the infinite difference, right, to create a triangle with proportions that match the divine balance of Leonardo's unique squaring of the circle? How is that possible? Right? And these specific values reveal the gravitational constant and 1 over 24, or 24 squared, 2.4 squared, that just seemed very, very bizarre.
to me, that it coincidentally comes out to those exact values. So then I took it and saw, you know, let me see what happens if I go ahead and make, you might have seen I've been doing a lot of work with logarithmic spirals. If I take a logarithmic spiral and I spiral it in and spiral it out in each of its positions, right, as I'd already kind of talked about before, you could take a hexagon and scribe another hexagon within it, just rotate it uh, once so that it fits in there perfectly, and then do the same thing and the same thing over and over and over again, and you can create a beautiful logarithmic spiral. And then you can find, simply by finding what is the ratio of the hypotenuse over the height, and that's going to give you that ratio. And this is exactly the ratio of the hypotenuse over the height in the infinite sum and the infinite product. So it comes out to this 1.08108, which you see this number repeating twice, and then you, it just goes squared to the third power, to the fourth power, to the fifth power, just keeps going around, and you would have a mod 16 and some change on this, on this particular type of spiral. Now let's go back for just a moment and remember where we started from, which was from last year. The number 24 and 26 showing up right here around the head. So something with the square root of 25, and I even drew here the number 1 right at the center. Okay. So what Alan had pointed out to me was he's like, you know, this reminds me of the keystone in the arch of Royal Arch Freemasonry. And, and so I decided to overlay this keystone in the arch of Royal Arch Freemasonry. So you've got, you know, the sun and the moon. You've got this compass and square. You've got the, the bull, the, the, the man, uh, the lion, and the eagle, which is the four fixed signs. So you've got the Taurus, uh, Scorpio, which is the eagle, and and you've also got the, the man, which is Aquarius, and the lion is Leo. So these symbols showing up all over the place. So I've got the, both overlays on here, and you can see here the royal arch, the royal arch of Royal Arch Freemasonry. And I put it right on the plane of this checkerboard, which you see in a lot of Freemason stuff. Now, just to, for full disclosure, I'm not a Freemason. Um, I've not been a Freemason, uh, certainly not, a, at least in this lifetime. But I do study a lot about the things that they have done and what they believe in. But I, I got a text message the other day from someone on Instagram who basically said, are you a brother? <laughs> Which I was like, uh-oh. And of course I'm a brother, but in the universal sense, but not in a Freemasonry sense. So you could see this a little bit clearer in this picture. And in a lot of Freemasonry stuff, you'll always notice that letter G, right? The letter G showing out. But when I did this overlay, it was kind of uh, strange for me because I noticed, first of all, that strangely, the letter G on this Royal Arch Freemasonry thing, when it fit perfectly over, over the Vitruvian man's head, was right over the number 24. So I've got G and 24 showing up right here. And why is that significant? Well, it became significant because... I noticed that every one of these values could be derived simply from the number 24 and the gravitational constant. For example, the gravitational constant to the power of 0 0.242 is this value down here. That comes out to that 1.583233. Um, and this value here, the height, which was 3.85415, can be derived as 2.403 squared. All of them have tiny little fractions, but they're not different first two numbers, not even close. And then 1 over 24 here. And even, um, you know, all of the different aspects of this, including even the angles and everything, could all be derived simply with the numbers 1, 24, and G, gravity. Now, how is that? I was just kind of stunned by that too. And it re reminded me as well that I had done this thing on the singularity convergence theory, on the importance of 24. And you could see here, this was a, I'd done, uh, you know, some 
class and discussion on this already, but basically you could see that there's 12 and 12. So you've got a mod 24 relationship inside, and which is mirroring music, and then off of this, all musical chords and everything can be derived between numbers. Uh, so, you know, a, a major third would be a triplet. Um, you know, like the numbers one, four, and seven, four is a major third of the number one in this context when you use 12 and 12 on both sides. And perfect geometries come out of this as well. Alan even made a video of like dancing music uh, that look almost like cymatics coming off of this design. But there's something fundamental to this particular two-dimensional mod 24 grid or spiral and I was very happy that recently I finally found exactly what the Mod 24 spiral should be based on the geometry of, of uh, you know, a dodecagon, 12. So whatever geometry you want to put in, you can double it. That will become the mod function of it. Okay, and then you'll get all these perfect relationships to whole number of values at each of the separate mods. So it'll go first power, second power, third power, fourth power, fifth power, sixth power, and so on. Well, the cube octahedron which this is also from the work that we did this past year on precise temperament tuning, is unique to the number 24 because it has 24 edges, right? So 14 sides, but 24 edges. And that 24 and those edges relate to each of these positions around the mod 24. The mod 24 is where we discovered the prime number pattern. So the, all the red numbers Right, so mod one, mod five, seven, 11, 13, 17, 19, and 23 all had prime numbers in them, or quasi-prime numbers, just like this. And so what you find is the cube octahedron, the Archimedean solid, is the structure of space-time and the three and four-dimensional representation of mod 24. Now, in John Dee's Enochian tables, he made an incredible table that is full of Enochian letters that nobody's really been able to decipher yet, not, not us either. And it is a grid of 24 by 26. So 24 times 26, I may have forgot to mention this, is 624. So not only do we make a right triangle, but the multiplication of it creates this relationship. So 24 times 26 equals 25 squared. Think of it like that. It's very close to 25 squared. It's 24.97999. This is a drawing that I did um, actually the night my son, uh, well, it was actually a couple days before my son was, was going to be born, and uh, my wife was sleeping, and I was kind of up, and I couldn't go to sleep, and so I was, uh, she was just, you know, kind of going in and out of labor. So I started drawing this, this picture, and you'll notice that there was another drawing that was done behind it that I had not even really recognized, and I, I've changed the contrast on this so that you can see this spiral that's coming through here that has some, some unique characteristics. The spiral ended in the, on the tip of where the base of the pyramid was. It looked like it's spiraling out of the center of this larger circle. And when I had drawn this Vitruvian man, I immediately knew when I drew these circles that this was informing the positions of chambers in the Great Pyramid. And I, that's when I called Alan and I said, that and the combination of this point of the square, which was so unique, was 51.843 degrees against the circle. So from here down to here is 51.843 degrees. If I move my zero point to here, then it would be 30, you know, it'd be, it'd be 38.16 uh, uh, degrees going this direction, but still the non-displaced part of it would be 51.843. So this relationship I knew was critically important, and I knew immediately that each of these points, and then likewise where the horizontal lines have been drawn by da Vinci, uh, were going to inform the chambers of the pyramid. I just had a hunch, and then Alan and I worked on it together, and, uh, and Alan also confirmed it. Now, what was also interesting is the background of this particular picture, though, had this written behind it. So this is another page that was kind of unrelated, but again, it comes back to that spiral of Theodorus. Right? This is a different perspective on the spiral of Theodorus. This time, I had drawn it this direction, right? and, and so uh, it finished in this one only at the number 18. 
Now, when I did it with the class for philosophical geometry, I continued it all the way out to up to, you know, 25 and 26 and 27 and 28. But I stopped it here on this particular one that I'd done. And at the base, I had drawn the number 1 and 1 and said that the fractal root of 1 is 3.16227766 multiplied by 0.316227766 equals 1 exactly. So we say the square root of 1, okay, the square root of 1 is uh, clearly 1, but is there another way to express it for fractals? Because the universe has to be able to do that, and what we had discovered is that there is. That, you know, the square root of 1 could be derived as the square root of 10, right, which is 3.16227766, and then, uh, you know, take that number and divide it by 10 and multiply those two numbers together, you're going to come back to a value that is, you know, the number 1. So you could do that with every number. So you could do it with pi, for example. Pi has a square root of 1.772. But if we were to take the fractal root of pi to see what geometric correspondences we could find with it, we would take the fractal root of pi does no longer, it's no longer just you know, 1.772, it's 5.60499. So 5.6 is giving us a pentagon and hexagon. So 5.60499 multiplied by 0.560499 equals 3.14159. And the universe, unlike us, you know, we, we use these decimal positions because that's kind of our point of reference, right? It's, it's our, it's our, point of, of perception. But the universe just takes numbers and multiplies them together. So that means there's a whole lot of other understanding that we've been missing. So that's why Talal and I wrote a paper on this called the fractal root of numbers. You can find it on our website. And it works for all scales of numbers and all kinds of roots and cube roots and you know uh, all exponential values as well, without exception. So what you notice is that I had drawn, you know, going back to that prior page, right here, you could see underneath the page the number 1 and the square root of 1 showing up right in here, or the fractal root of 1, rather, or square root of 10, however you want to put it. And here it is again, showing up in reality, with the 0.24, the 0.259, or 0.26, and this value down here, and you, you double that value, and you end up with this fractal root of 1, um, which was just kind of a mind blower to me. So what this really shows us is that relationship. So I could take this value, add it to this value, which equals 5, right? 2.6 plus 2.4, or 25, plus 26 equals 50, right? It doesn't really matter which fractal we're using. And then I'm going to say 2.6 right, minus 2.4 is going to be 0 0.2. 2 2.6 plus 2.4 equals 5. Then that allows me to solve what the other side will be, right? So I'm going to now take 2 point, or 0 0.2, multiply it by 5. 0 0.2 times 5 equals 1. And that is the value of this side right here. I referenced it as the square root of 1, but in this case, it's 1. If it's going to be a fractal root, I always put an FR above it. That's how you'll know to do the calculation on your own. Now, what I also noticed was that, okay, so this triangle was exactly, remember, number one, it was just the reference of drawing this triangle proportion from here to here, which is a very unique square and a very unique circle. That just happened to match perfectly against a ratio of 26 and 24 and 1 over 24 and 1 over 26, which also just happened to match the infinite sum of numbers and the infinite product of numbers. Let's see what else it might match up with. So I also took this line here and intersected this point here because anytime there's an intersection, there's usually something important that's happening, right? So you got this circle and this square happening. So I thought I might as well draw a line here to see what else might come up. And then I remembered a dollar bill.
Now, why did I think of the dollar bill? Well, it just popped in my head. But secondly, because the dollar bill pyramid has kind of been an enigma because it's a 67.68 degree slope. It's a very steep pyramid. There's no pyramids like this. You might say that there's one in Rome that's pretty close, but it's just, it's quite a bit off actually, but, but it's kind of closer than all the others. There are pyramids also that are in um, Sudan that have a much steeper, you know, sort of slope angle like this, but, but actually they're even much steeper. They, they happen to be at 72 degrees angles. So this is r uniquely at 67.68 degrees, and it's exactly what's on the dollar bill. And not only that, but even this line that intersects where the circle, Da Vinci circle meets the Da Vinci square is informing exactly the three-dimensional depth perception of this pyramid? Really? So, not only were these proportions related to the Shakespeare Code, the 624, 24 and 26, not only were these just natural proportions of the square and circle of the unsquared circle and the uncircled square because they're not matching, right? Not only did that match exactly also the infinite sum of the infinite product, but those values actually derive for us gravity and 24 squared. And now it happens to land exactly on the only place you'll find this exact kind of pyramid that I've seen anywhere is right on the dollar bill. And who designed this dollar bill? George Washington himself, who was a Freemason. So what do you think? Do you think maybe he knew a little bit more about some of this esoteric knowledge than what all of us have come to believe or realize? And the references are 26, 24, 624, 1, and of course 25. All of them leading back to a conclusion for me that there's a much deeper knowledge here that we're just scratching the surface of. And of course the symbolism we have here, this is called the Eye of Providence. Now the Eye of Providence is representing, you can see it's a left eye so Horace had two eyes. <laughs> it's funny. I, I, I put a post out about, you know, the eye of Thoth, because the reason why sometimes it's referred to as the eye of Thoth instead of the eye of Horace is because both eyes were Horace's eyes. But in the context that both of them were Horace's eyes, the left eye was repaired and fixed. It was the one that was taken out and the battle was set. But it was repaired and fixed by magic by Thoth. Hermes, the thrice crown, the thrice great. And the other eye is the eye of Ra. So this could represent also the separation between masculine and feminine. The eye of Ra is the masculine, the eye of Horus is the feminine. And the eye of Horus is represented by the moon. That's why it's also referenced by Thoth. You know, if you look at the symbol for Mercury, there's a crown on Mercury that looks just like the Taurus symbol. So the Mercury symbol in alchemy and astrology is really a combination of, of both the Taurus symbol as well as um, the Venus symbol. And if you look at D, John D's Monas Hieroglyphica, you'll notice that there's even an Aries symbol at the base, right, right where the root would be. But basically what we're finding here is that this is the Eye of Horus. So it's the awakening of mankind to a new knowledge. Now, what are all the things that are written on here? I'll tell you that one of them is this quote down here at the bottom, right? Which I'll, I'll just say, uh, there are two meanings that relate to this. And you probably already know E Pluribus Unum, right? So E Pluribus Unum is the one that everybody knows to quote, right? And it is, it is a meaning of um, you know, from many, one, or one from many. So omnia ab uno means many from one. And e pluribus unum means one from many. 
So that was kind of a thing that stuck out to me. But there are these other quotes that were interesting because basically what they are saying is that he, in this context, is a reference to God. You know, he accepts or approves of our undertakings. Okay, and that's what this is down here, the Novus uh, Order Secorum. And then the other one, which is Anuus Coeptus, basically is another reference. So he approves of our undertakings and basically the other Anuus Coeptus and E Pluribus Unum references are not only the approves of our uh, of our undertakings, but also this is the new order, right? So this is the new order, Novus Order Secorum is the new order of ages, excuse me, new order of ages. And this one up here is he approves of our undertakings. So I don't know what this could mean further. What I do believe is that George Washington obviously had some purpose in placing these there and that he very likely had knowledge of the Vitruvian man and the proportions of the Vitruvian man because here we have all of them found inside this one pyramid, which is kind of mind-blowing. And not only that, but if I were to draw out the right triangle for the number one, these would be the proportions of the right triangle of the number one. And here we have this on the dollar bill, which is got the, you know, the word one written all over it. So with that, I will open up to uh, questions that we might have. Let me go ahead and flip this around. Hi, everyone. And uh, is this elite level mathematics? <laughs> I wouldn't say it's elite level necessarily. I think it's, you can find it all uh, pretty simply. It's pretty basic math. It's not really difficult. But, but basically, um, you know, I think this is another level of mathematics from the perspective of language. We understand that math is a language and that we can access that language and tap into it. Um, it speaks to us in different ways. And I think many people are experiencing this right now, that people are having different experiences with, with numbers and they'll see synchronicities and more and more synchronicities and almost feel like numbers are alive. Um, and I'll just do a quick poll. How many of you... Uh, think that you've noticed like the same numbers over and over again, uh, at least in the last year or so. Well, you know, one of the other things also of, of the number 24 is that its reciprocal value is 42. So 24 is a unique number because it's one of only three, you know, pairs of numbers that has a reciprocal value that's equal to its uh, palindrome value. So 24 has a palindrome of 42, and 1 over 24 is a close approximation for 42. By the same token, you have the same thing with alpha constant, which is 73 marries up against 137. So, you know, again, you've got this palindrome reciprocal relationship, and the same thing with 175 and 57.1. So 57.1, palindrome 175, and what do we end up with? The 1 over x of 57.1 is 175. So those three numbers appear to have very unique characteristics that other numbers just simply don't have. Okay, another question. All right. Um, done this in school. <laughs> okay, got it. Right. 72 degree base angle in the pentacle. Okay, an experience divine. If you do not do this, okay, that's what I built. It looks like there's some conversations going on here. Any other questions? I've got so many comments coming up here. It's hard to see. Any other questions? Okay, please explain about infinity factorial. So infinity factorial is just one times two times three times four times five times six times seven. And uh, algebraically, it comes out to the square root of 2 pi, which is, you can look it up. Just don't, don't believe me. Just look it up. Look these things up. You can find it on, on YouTube, um, and you can find lots of videos from, you know, standard kind of like academics who are going to tell you that 
but yes, these, these come out to, uh, particularly you'll find a lot on infinite sum. You'll find less on infinite factorial, but they exist. Uh, there are several videos that I found on it as well. Okay. Um, okay, someone says, what are we counting that came in late? Well, I think that's basically all that, uh, that I have to talk with you about today. Uh, very interested to see uh, what you guys think about this work and, and go ahead and just post on my last post on this if you have any other questions and I wasn't able to get it because it's kind of hard to to reference the questions while we're doing this live but I think there's a very powerful message here for me at least and the message that I get out of this is that we're all one and that what we consider as the outside world really is just the you inverse and their reflections. And if we keep continuing to experience the same things over and over again, maybe it's because we only see the things that we want to see. And so then we have to ask ourselves the question, if we continue to struggle or have challenges or difficulties where we face the same issues over and over, maybe we love the struggle. And maybe we need to find out what it is within us that allows us or, or pushes us still to love the struggle so that we can let it go. And on that, I'll go ahead and close off today, sending you all love. And uh, when people say love and light, it's kind of funny because I often joke that the term love and light has become kind of the, the new age way to say F you. <laughs> but actually, I think of it this way, that love and gravity are synonymous in my mind because gravity is the love that keeps the entire universe together and connects all of us. So when people say love and light, what they're really saying is, you know, dark and light, which is exactly what the word guru is in Sanskrit. So dark and light, or out of darkness, light. And, and I don't think that darkness is a bad thing. I think that we have conditioned our thinking to be afraid of those things we don't understand and those things that we cannot see. But maybe we don't need to be afraid. And if we can find those things that, and no longer be afraid of those things that are within us, then we'll no longer fear that which is outside of us. I watched a film last night, The Talented Mr. Ripley, which is kind of a disturbing film about this guy who had a very, very dark shadow. And it really made me think, because I think we all don't want to see certain things in our life and in our experience. We, we just simply don't want to perceive certain aspects that are not perfect, they are not great, that are not what we would deem to be desirable or attractive. And those are the things that we have to really start to learn how to accept and learn to embrace, or we simply will continue to face these things over and over and over again. We'll face the same follies, the same challenges, the same patterns. With that, wish you all a wonderful day and talk to you soon. Bye.